All right, if you guys are, uh, if everybody's done eating, I think that most, most folks are, uh, are finished eating. We're going we're gonna to start the program. Again, my name's Adam Hinton. Thank you guys for, for being here with us today. I do want to take this opportunity to, to just briefly tell you guys about our family business. Uh, I'm fourth generation in the, in the farm supply business. Our, uh, my great-grandfather started our business 100 years ago this year. So we are celebrating our centennial, and we'd love for you guys to come back throughout the year and celebrate with us uh, as we have events. But uh, the, the story of Hinton Mills starts a little bit before 1918, and some of you guys have heard this story, but I do want to share this for those of you who haven't and for Secretary Purdue. Uh, my great-grandfather that started our business when he was uh, nine years old, he unfortunately found himself as an orphan. His, both his mother and his father had, had passed away, and uh, because of which he only had a third-grade education. Uh, his grandmother uh, took him in and uh, his, his siblings, and he found himself as the, the man of the family. And the, uh, the way that he got, uh, got his start and, and kind of got our business starting was uh, raising a baby calf. Uh, in fact, on our logo, you guys have probably seen, you were asking about this cow head. That's, uh, that represents that, uh, that first baby calf that started our business. But my great-grandfather, uh, the way the story goes, probably a neighbor, somebody that felt sorry for little orphan Frank, uh, gave him a calf. He raised that calf and sold it, and he uh, took that money. I'm sure he bought some groceries or necessities and bought another calf and took that calf, raised it, and sold it, and repeat. And next thing you know, he's raising two at a time or three at a time, and, and that's how we got started in our, our business. And then uh, come uh, a few years later, let's move fast forward to the 1950s when my, uh, my papa, uh, my papa Hinton, he, when he got back from World War II, he, he joined the family business. And uh, all he wanted to do was be a cattleman. And so he had a little farm and he had cattle and uh, he would take care of his cattle after work and on the weekends. And um, so anyway, he, he realized it was inconvenient for him to have to go somewhere and get his feed ground. And so he decided maybe his neighbors might appreciate uh, the opportunity to grind feed and mix feed close to home too. So that's how we got in the feed business. So if you fast forward to now, we've got uh, five locations and 50 and some just really amazing people on our team that service this, this part of the state. Uh, we sell feed, seed, fertilizer, fencing material, all the same stuff that a lot of the other folks uh, in this room sell or, or folks that uh, in your community sell those same things. So at the end of the day, there's nothing we do that, uh, that Senator Hornback and Representative Heath couldn't do right across the road from us. Please don't, but you could. Um, <laughs> But there's nothing we, that we sell that, that's, that's uh, special uh, or unique. What we do is we're a service business, a relationship business, and a logistic business. So if you scale that down a little further, we're a people business. And that's why all of you guys are here today. Agriculture is about people. And I want to highlight uh, you know, a few people real quick. I do want to say um, that how proud I am to be here to represent my, my brothers, Matt and Nathan, um, my, my dad, uh, my, my mom, my cousin Donnie, and, and our team. So I thank you guys for the opportunity to let me get up and speak on behalf of, of us. Um, and then I want to highlight one other uh, person. Our, uh, you know, you talk about service logistics relationships. Uh, Ronald Lawrence, our manager here at the Maze Lick store, he's been with us for, for 32 years. This is his... Uh, his first job off the dairy farm was here at Hinton Mills, and so when you guys think about relationships and logistics, if you do business with us and, and think about serving people, Ronald Lawrence would come to mind. So uh, again, agriculture is about people, and I'm going to introduce one of those people, and then I'm going to sit down and let these guys talk. So the, the person that I'm going to introduce is, is a mentor to me. Um, I don't know if he realizes that, but he's a mentor to a lot of people across, uh, across the state of Kentucky. Mr. David Beck is uh, with Kentucky Farm Bureau. Um, Mr. Beck is from Lyon County, and he was uh, a state FFA officer, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, he's been with Farm Bureau since 1977, I believe, and has served in various capacities, and including now as the executive vice president of Farm Bureau. And not only am I proud of how he advocates for <coughs> agriculture across the state, but for me personally, I'm, I'm proud of what a fine Christian example that you are to me and to others. So I'm going to turn things over to Mr. David Beck. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Adam, and uh, thank you for the opportunity for Kentucky Farm Bureau to be a part of this event today and help with the meal and arrangements for it. Uh, i got several members of our board here, and if you're a board member of Farm Bureau, just raise your hand or stand if you would, please. We appreciate our board directors, our, our president, Mark Haney, and, 
Eddie Miller, first vice president, could not be here today, but Mr. Giske, our second vice president, is, and he gave the invocation. We're so honored, Mr. Secretary, that you're here today in Kentucky. It's a special opportunity for our people to be able to chat with you, talk with you, ask you questions, and hear about some plans and things you have that will be affecting our industry. But I want to say first, though, how much we appreciate Adam and his family. Adam, you're a tremendous leader, not just in this community, but throughout Kentucky. And your family and what you do, the service you provide, the way you do it, the example of how to do agribusiness, how to do agriculture, how to be a leader in your community, how to give back. We appreciate that so much. Thank you for hosting us. Let's show our appreciation to the Kenton family. <laughs> for what they do and how they do it. We appreciate them so much in so many, many different ways. You know, it, uh, it is special to have the Secretary of Agriculture with us here today. Uh, today's the first time I've had a chance to meet him personally, but I read a lot about him. And, uh, and I'm just going to share a little story. Uh, those of us in agriculture that watch the nomination process pretty closely, my good friend Zippy Duval can tell me a lot about you personally and his wife Bonnie, about you and, and Mary. And, and uh, those of us in agriculture, I can say it's safe to say we had a good feeling of peace and comfort when you were named. Secretary of Agriculture, because we've got someone in that position that understands production and agriculture. We've got a man in that position that grew up on a dairy farm. He's been involved in agriculture. He served in the legislative process, been a two-term governor. He knows how it works. He understands the issue. As a licensed veterinary, a man knows how to take care of livestock and knows what's the right way to do it. Having people in that position uh, to help lead our industry lay the groundwork with the Congress and administration, and just think, we've got a person sitting around the cabinet table that's been there, understands production agriculture. Mr. Secretary, we appreciate that so much for what you do. I've been asked to mention two or three issues, and then after that, I want to introduce our commissioner of agriculture state level. Some things that we don't expect you to answer now, but maybe think about it. During the Q&A, maybe you could shed some light on some of these topics. We all know we're getting ready to deal with the Farm Bill. <clears throat> Hearings process are already been going on. We've had working groups here in Kentucky for many months working on the Farm Bill. It's important to all of us. Even those not production agriculture depend heavily on this Farm Bill. It's important to Kentucky's economy. And we respect that, we know that, and we've got to have the right legislation at the end of the day. Some of the things that come to mind that are on the agenda, <clears throat> I mentioned dairy. And that's a tough issue. I know you come from a dairy farm. Uh, just a few weeks ago, we had over 100 dairy farmers in this region of our country that got a letter that says, in the May, we're not going to take your milk anymore. Now, folks, that's hard. That's tough. And I've tried to explain that to some of my city neighbors, what that means. It's like walking out of that plant in the afternoon at shift change, and you get an envelope. We don't need you after May. But in addition to not having a job, look at the investment. you got to liquidate your herd, your investment, what's your family going to do. That's devastating to farm families. And I know we've talked about it for years, and we've been a part of that public policy process, but we've got to talk about what we're going to do to the future of dairy in this industry, in this country, from the pricing, from production and cost, transportation, all that. In Louisville, Kentucky, where I live, uh, I took a snapshot and shared it on Facebook this weekend. Milk was 70 for 78 cents a gallon. So it'd be chocolate, whole milk, or 2%, uh, 78 cents a gallon. And I can't find anything else I can buy a gallon of for 78 cents. But that's what we're dealing with out there. Hopefully there's some attention to be given to that and we can see some short-term answers but long-term answers in this farm bill. I see Hilda Leg here with Rural Development, our director. Uh, rural Development is important to all of us. Uh, broadband, what can we expect with internet service? Those of us in Nashville during the American Farm Year Annual Meeting back in January when you were there along with the President, uh, we were so appreciative to see the executive order signed laying the groundwork to do more for infrastructure. We need that in Kentucky. We need wise decisions being made for all the infrastructure. But I want to mention broadband. <clears throat> I know we have members of General Assembly here, and they talk about it. It's a priority for them. In rural Kentucky, we're behind, and we're losing ground every day on not having broadband service. Now think about it from an educational standpoint. We have young kids that have to go back to town at night to a fast food restaurant to do their homework just be able to get internet service. That's one component of this. Another component of those is in agribusiness like this facility here. You gotta be able to take that plastic card. You gotta be able to deal with internet and promotion and access. Our farm markets, our farmers own operations. Broadband's important. Now, Secretary, we welcome hearing any thoughts you would have of what we can do, what USDA can do through rural development other areas to help us bridge that gap. As, as a society and an economy, as we depend more and more 
on technology, we're going behind, we're losing ground fast. We're getting further behind as we try to deal with this issue. So I just want to mention that this one that's important to us. Another one is water. I want to talk about water. We all have seen the numbers and what's going to happen in 2050 and how many more people we got to feed in this country. And with less land, less chemicals, less labor, and sometimes less water. Water is a critical issue. It is for agriculture, but it's also for economic development. Think about water for a minute. A state like ours, we get plenty of rainfall. The problem is we don't get it at the right time. You can pretty much count on it every year in Kentucky, we're going to go from a drought to a flood. We don't know which part of the state, but one of us will get too much rain, and some of us will get too, not enough. We have that every year we're dealing with. I'm very proud that in Kentucky, uh, our legislature took action. Uh, our GOEP office, Governor's Office of State Policy, is working with us, helping with us, our Natural Resources Cabinet, our governor. We're trying to deal with how we can do a better job of capturing that water and having it to reduce our costs on the farm, for our crops, but also for our livestock. But it's an economic development issue as well and also talk about how we deal with that with, with the cities. We don't need farmers and city folks fighting over the water. We all be able to capture that water for everybody's benefits. I know Karen with our NRCS is here. Your office is working. We appreciate that, our state conservationists. Water's an issue, and, and we'll be looking with USDA too. What can we do to help us do a better job? Maybe loosen the rules so NRS can be more helpful to us, give us the right advice to move forward in the water issues. I want to mention trade. Uh, we had an opportunity earlier this week, some of us did, to talk with Leader McConnell uh, about trade. Uh, we know it's a major issue. We depend heavily on trade in agriculture. We've got to have it. Uh, over a third of our grain pro produced here in Kentucky goes overseas. But poultry, beef, pork, same thing, Commissioner, that's what we're dealing with. It's important. Farm income, the bottom line, is heavily dependent in this state on what we're going to deal with. It comes down to trade. We realize that's an issue for the administration. We appreciate you being there, working to help us in NAFTA and trade agreements and things. It's very important. So, Mr. Secretary, I just want to mention those issues. You've got Under Secretary McKinney. Thank you for making that appointment. We think he'll be a tremendous asset to you and your team as you work on these trade issues. We want you to know Kentucky depends heavily on trade. We do today, and we're going to do some more so tomorrow. So it's very important. So I just want to share those topics with you. I know others that have things here they want to bring up too later on during the Q&A, but I want to get those in front of you today if I may. Now it's my opportunity and my privilege to introduce a, what I consider a good friend, our Commissioner of Agriculture, Commissioner Ryan Quarles. He was elected to that seat in 2015. The, uh, it seems like a lot longer than that with all he's been doing. A tremendous staff, they've been doing some good things. The <coughs> Hunger Initiative, finally breaking through, dealing with the tough issue to help folks have reduce that 6% in Kentucky and deal with that food situation. Trade, I mentioned it a while ago, your work in China on equine is going to be beneficial to the state and have a domino effect for lots of industries. I know you're leading a group to Canada this, this summer. We appreciate the effort there to try to strengthen those relationships. Uh, this man wants to serve agriculture. He's been working to bring about new markets. But I'm not surprised with that. You're not either. Uh, I've kind of watched him grow up in our organization, in FFA and 4-H, and I know he's a leader, and you do as well. Uh, he was elected to the General Assembly, and when he was in the General Assembly, he served through three terms. He represented Scott County and Owen County, and he represented parts of Fayette County. And as I think back, that he served on the Ag Committee, when he served on making insurance and other committees, he was always asking, what can I do to help agriculture? What can I help to do for rural Kentucky? And he wasn't doing it for the headline. He wasn't doing it for the fanfare. He was wanting to know what he could do behind the scenes to make fanfare. Commissioner, we appreciate that leadership and that example you provide. Please join me in welcoming to today's program our Commissioner of Agriculture, Mr. Ryan Quarles. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for that wonderful introduction. And Mr. Secretary, welcome to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We're the home of fast horses, Louisville Slugger baseball bats, Ford F-150s, and 95% of the bourbon that's made in this world, and 100% of the bourbon that's worth drinking is made <laughs> right here uh, in Kentucky. Uh, we're a small farm state. We have 76,000 farms here, average farm size. Remember the national average, relatively small, uh, 160 acres. And so almost all of our farms, including the farmers you see in this crowd, our family businesses, and that's something that I know that you take very seriously. Uh, David, thank you for the introduction. Congratulations. Uh, just announced today the new CEO of the Kentucky State Fair and Expo Center, so congratulations on that. 
Thank you to the Hinton family. You're looking pretty good for 100 years old. So thanks for serving us. And thank you to Kentucky Farm Bureau for helping uh, organize this today. We know that Secretary Purdue is a very smart man because one of the first people he brought onto his team was a Kentucky farm girl. Uh, Rebecca Adcock uh, from Eastern Kentucky, grew up on a farm, worked for Kentucky Farm Bureau. So congratulations on empowering smart Kentucky people around your staff. Secretary Purdue is a very uh, qualified person. We are so fortunate that when President Trump put forth his name that we had someone that we could, uh, that knew and had some, had some dirt on, on his boots to understand agriculture. He grew up on a dairy and row crop farm down in down Georgia. Uh, he served in the state legislature as a state senator. He served in the Air Force and uh, left as a rank of captain, so he served our country as well. But one thing that I know that sticks with him was growing up on his farm. His dad said that if you take care of the land, the land will take care of you. And that's something we share that same value right here uh, in Kentucky. Uh, he's been married to his wife, uh, Mary. I'm not sure where she's at for 45 years. There and uh, have four children, 14 grandchildren, and they also served as foster parents for eight different young people awaiting adoption. So we thank you for what you do for that. And so we're happy to have you here. And if for some reason he looks familiar before he was uh, nominated for Secretary of Agriculture, if you ever seen the movie We Are Marshall, <laughs> he was an actor. <laughs> he was Coach McGee for East Carolina. And so thanks for, thank you for your, you did a great job with your acting debut. Thank you for being here, and we're glad that you have our head coach at the USDA right now, Secretary Sonny Perdue. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner, very much. Thank you all for the hospitality. Adam, Matt, Nathan, and Mr. and Ms. Hinton, thank you all for welcoming us here. It's a, a great location, and we love to come to family businesses. This has been kind of my career, so I feel very comfortable here to, at a business like this and look out across this crowd. As you introduced me as having dirt on my boots with it, from the dairy farm. It was a lot more than dirt. So, uh, <laughs> but I think you guys probably know about that, don't you? But uh, nonetheless, uh, I want to welcome all of you today and thank you for coming out to here. I appreciate our chairman of the House and Ag Committee being here. The dean, thank you for coming today as well as other our local legislators uh, for this district. So it's really important really to come together and, uh, and make government work. And I know that you all have these cards here at your, uh, at your tables. I hope you'll take advantage of that. You won't find many government agencies that are gonna put a phone number on we wanna hear from you. And that shows you how sincere we are. There's a, there's a uh, web address where you can go and, and, and put your thoughts down, usda.gov, tell Sonny, uh, or a phone number if you'd prefer. But it's really important that uh, for government to work, we've got we to communicate. And that's why I'm here. I don't have all the answers. In fact, I don't even know all the questions. But uh, David talked about some. And uh, I'm not going to talk very long because I, wanna, I came to listen. I want to hear from you about what works and what doesn't, what's, uh, what you'd like to see in the Farm Bill, your anxieties over trade, dairy program, and different things like that that uh, uh, are on your mind. So we can either have an answer, provide an answer about what's being done, what we need to know, or what we will do in, in taking these things down. We bring a staff with us to record the things that you talk about, and uh, so we can better be informed to do better. So that's, the, that's our goal, and that's what we want to be. We want to be a government that's as close to you as you'll let us be, and a USDA that you can count on, depend on, to, to meet your needs and advocate for you. I view my role in the Trump administration in two ways, and this is really a bilateral. I, I believe it's my responsibility to represent the interest of agriculture and advocate for agriculture in general to the president, to the White House, to the staff there. And then I also think it's my responsibility, vice versa, to represent him and his policies and uh, his thoughts and his decisions back to the ag community. So that's why we're here, to have a bilateral conversation of uh, what's on your mind and what we can do. And with that in mind, I'd like to hush and we're gonna ask the commissioner, I guess, to either uh, moderate. I find that you don't really need to be too uh, inviting when you wanna know what's on farmers' minds. Most of the time they'll tell you. So uh, if, even if you, if you ask, they'll tell you. Sometimes, commissioner, if you don't ask, they'll tell you. Right. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you and would welcome any kind, no, no questions are off the table. Uh, if they're uncomfortable, then uh, Ask them anyway, and we'll be uncomfortable together. Okay. 
Larry. It's such a glad to have you here. Yes. Really, really honored. Uh, I serve as the president of the Kentucky Soybean Association. So with these new tariff talks, uh, really scary thing the farmers in Kentucky and where they should leave. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, what your discussions have been. And the president has said that he was going to protect agriculture and it's a trade war. So how does he want to do that? Sure. Uh, told me that as recently as night before last. He said, Sonny, know you're on the road in Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, and uh, I want you to tell the farmers that uh, uh, we're not going to let them be the casualties in any kind of trade disputes. Now, obviously, it's not probably very smart in these kind of things to lay all your cards on the table about what you're going to do, but he's uh, authorized me already to use the authorities we have within the current appropriations, the Commodity Credit Corporation and others, uh, to develop a plan once we see what the impact of these uh, tariffs will be. Uh, my advocacy to him is that, Mr. President, I think you've got their attention. Now let's get to the table and resolve this because the two major economies in the world uh, both only get hurt when you start having trade disputes. Now, I want to say very loudly, clearly, and proudly that I'm proud of President Trump for calling China's hands. They hadn't played by the rules joined the FT, WTO in early 2000s, and they've cheated ever since. And they are uh, over in agriculture. Have you heard the story about them going out in the field and picking up corn seed and trying to reverse, uh, reverse engineer the genetics of corn, corn seed here? So they, they've stolen and uh, they've imposed uh, intellectual property transfer for companies that want to do business over there. So uh, I'm proud to serve a man that will call it on the, you know, call on the line. And, and put us at some risk to say, we're not going to keep on tolerating your cheating. Now, that, that he understands there may be some temporary pain, and I've told him, farmers and some of the best patriots I know, they serve their country, and they till this soil, they provide a national security through food security, and they're willing to do their part. They don't want to be sacrificing alone, by the way, and he understands that, and that's the message he's told me, is that you tell them that we're not going to let uh, them be the, the only the casualties in this the, in this battle here there. So I bring that message to you. I, I don't. I would love to be more specific about some of the things we've been talking about for weeks and months about a modeling uh, if this comes about. But uh, we need to reserve those kind of details for uh, uh, for later on when we implement them because uh, I don't. I'm not. I don't think we ought to as a nation ought to show all our cards at one time. So. Uh, I don't know what kind of relief that is. There's a legitimate anxiety. We, uh, I frankly was pleasantly surprised that the markets haven't been hit as hard as they have, honestly. Now, the good news about it, these are, these are saber rattlings. The tariffs haven't started yet. Hopefully it's a warning to one another that, uh, you know, if, uh, if you don't do this, then we're going to do that. We got 30 to 60 days to start sitting down and negotiating, and that's what we're encouraging the president and his team you got their attention now. Let's get out into business and negotiate the things that are meaningful. But uh, that's kind of where we are. Secretary, uh, my name is Chris Mitchell. I'm from uh, from the county next door, Fleming County. I'm a cow calf producer, along with most everybody else in the room. As you know, Kentucky is the largest beef producer state east of the Mississippi River. Was in the dairy business, just like uh, you know they're talking about. I have gotten some of those letters, you know, in the past. And I know some of those letters went out when they said they weren't going to buy your milk anymore. I know some of those letters went out with a suicide hotline number. I have gotten some of those letters. I know they're legitimate. Mm -hmm. A long time ago. I wish I'd have kept one. Uh, not that they were uh, not buying my milk anymore, just that the milk prices were so depressed. Now that I'm in the beef industry, what I'm concerned about now, not only just as trade, but uh, this clean meat movement, clean meat, this artificial protein meat, lab-grown meat, whatever you want to call it, I don't want that product, you know, if somebody wants to make that product and, and market it and, and sell it, that's fine. But I don't want it to uh, be built on the, on the hard-earned reputation of, of uh, American beef farmers, especially Kentucky beef farmers. So I was wondering, <clears throat> I know it's in its infant stage right now, but I don't want to get behind the eight ball here like the dairy industry when they're trying to fight almond milk, soy milk, muscle milk, you know, 
and I don't want to be behind the eight ball trying to convince consumers there's a difference. Didn't know if uh, it thought about making different marketing rules for those, for those products or anything. Didn't know if anything like that was uh, being talked about. Sure, it's being considered, obviously. I think the president was probably support something like fake meat. You know. <laughs> the USDA has responsibility in labeling as well as the Food and Drug Administration. But you're exactly right. A cute story happened when the uh, the rice guys came in, and they were concerned about uh, some of these products like uh, cauliflower being called uh, cauliflower rice or something like that. I'd never seen the products, but some other things other than rice grain being used and called rice. And I said, man, that's terrible. I can't believe they'd do that. Is that kind of like rice milk? <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't say a lot after that. <laughs> but uh, your, your point's well taken, obviously. And uh, while uh, we got a lot of technological challenges. I'm still not convinced that the American consumer is going to pre prefer that. But from a labeling perspective, we need to make sure that it's not come, you know, a def definitive difference between animal protein and petri dish meat, if you want to call it that. So uh, we'll be looking at that. We don't probably, uh, we're ways away, I think, from any kind of commercial products on that. But uh, we'll try to stay ahead of that curve uh, as a good point you made. Yeah, I feel like. Uh the same way uh you know a lot of people won't eat white bread anymore yeah. so i'm like I, i'm not real sure that you're going to eat you know uh, uh, clean meat or whatever you want to whatever you want to label it but i also don't want to sleep on the issue and then one day half the meat cakes is taken up with sure. you know whatever they want well uh obviously uh, adam said he'd been in the marketing business marketers are very clever if you market something as quote clean meat what's the implication yeah. You know that that uh, others is not clean. We've we've seen a little bit of that, and we we have some struggle in our organic community. Organic uh, industry's done well, but early on in their marketing, the implication was we're organic, we're purer, we're better, we're more wholesome, and all that, and disparaging that. That's one. Uh, I don't know if the press is here or not. That's one reason I don't eat at Chipotle's now, because they disparage the American farmer, and I won't put up with that. Won't go in there. So. <laughs> Terry. Thank you for coming, Mr. Secretary. I'm Terry Rowley. I'm the chair of the Farm Bureau, the Farm Bureau and Dairy Committee. Yeah, I'm one of the minorities, one that's still trying to hang on uh, with low milk prices and so forth. I am fortunate I did not get a letter, so I am one of those. But uh, we'd like to thank you for the MPP program change. I think that's going to help a lot of the dairy farmers, especially here in Kentucky, the small dairy farmers. And I'm sure Mr. Maury Cox over here with the Kentucky Dairy Development Council can relate to some of these other items, and he probably will here shortly. And I'll, But the thing that I it concerns me is in the farm bill, or some parts of it, the school nutrition <coughs> aspect of dairy. Uh, somehow or another, we allow the dairy products, the milk, to go into schools that in my thought and process is very imperial. And, uh, and it turns the young people away from wanting to consume milk, the taste and so forth. So I would hope that somewhere along the line that some of the farm bill talks, some of the nutrition aspects of it, you will encourage uh, a higher butterfat content of milk uh, to be put into the school food programs and all, and to help us out in that that nature. And uh, and we all pray every day that tomorrow we'll look on the uh, internet and see that milk price futures has gone up some, so that we can continue to survive instead of erode our equity in our farming operation. Certainly. Good points. Let me address the second one first, and then we'll go back to the MPP program and the Farm Bill. Uh, one of the first things I, do, I did uh, after being confirmed, we went out to a school in, uh, in Virginia there and announced that we were going to uh, give a waiver on the regulations that 
flavored milk of 1% would be allowed back in the schools. That was a huge change. What we saw with the school nutrition guidelines that were put out in the former administration, we saw the trash can grow and the consumption uh, lessen uh, with, uh, with the usability of food. Uh, it can't be nutritious if you're throwing it away and stopping by the convenience store or the fast food store on the way home and filling, getting your calories that way. So that's one of the things we did. G.T. Thompson, a member of Congress, has a bill. We've gone about as far as we can regulatory-wise. Uh, he's got a bill statutorily that would go to the 2% level again in, uh, in uh, school nutrition, and we would like to see that pass. It possibly can become uh, part of the farm bill. There has been some discussions of being in the farm bill, which is where it needs to be. Within the agency, you can do a few things regulation-wide, and we did that. We slowed down uh, the salt limitation area going forward, and we stopped the requirement over 100% whole grain. There were three actions that we took. And those were the initial regulatory actions that we sent a signal to the school nutrition professionals that we wanted them to manage the school lunches, not prescription from on high. Uh, and we want to be healthy, we want to be wholesome, but we want it to be tasty as well so kids will drink it. And uh, you, put, uh, you put flavored skim milk out there and you know what kids are going to do, do with it. Thank you for mentioning the margin protection program. We actually didn't do that. That was Congress's solution to something they realized had not been effective in the 14 Farm Bill. Uh, the limits there uh, were not helpful. It was very little utilization. That's why last fall we allowed dairymen to get out of the, even the basic program because it had not been effective in that way and uh, many of them did. I think at this level uh, it will be helpful and I hope that uh, for the smaller dairies up to that five million pounds of milk uh, it will be uh, uh, hopefully a godsend over uh, the margin protection as we see the crunch. Uh, at some point we're probably going to see feed prices go back up again. That's just a, a factor of the commodity. Hopefully milk will precede that up but uh, we don't know about that. Oftentimes it crunches, crunches in and you don't have any options uh, there other than you've got to get that milk all the way over there every, every day or so. So uh, I hope that people will look at that. We just announced the, uh, I think the sign up will begin next week over the margin protection program and I hope you and your colleagues like in the dairy business will demonstrate that uh, there's, that's a better program. There may be some other po more positive changes coming in the farm bill along with that as well. So uh, hang in there. I, uh, I love that chocolate milk. Very important to us. It's important to us here in Kentucky. We've got a, a plant down in uh, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. So, just sort of your thoughts on that, and, and if uh, what kind of input you've got on that process, because it affects agriculture, but it's <coughs> it's really put in place by EPA. Right. Uh, the RFS program has been very helpful, obviously, for agriculture in general, but for corn producers primarily. Uh, Scott Pruitt, the EPA administrator, and I have a really good relationship. Uh, he's kind of in the barrel over some media issues right now, but uh, we've had good relationships. I, I have an inquiry into him right now over these waivers, uh, particularly this latest uh, either rumor or, uh, or actual waiver of the larger company in one of their smaller refineries. Uh, he, uh, he followed the president's direction, and the president's been strong on this over the 15 billion gallon RVO obligation there. I hope he's not trying to circumvent that with waivers initially. We were very disappointed in the bankruptcy case in Pennsylvania where, he, where EPA agreed to, uh, uh, to let them out of about, uh, I don't know, 300 million gallons or something like that. Uh, and then this other one along with the, there, there have been waivers and there were, the statute provided for waivers over small merchant refineries that didn't have the opportunity to blend like maybe some of the larger ones have. The, the, the one company that had about seven or eight, I think, refineries there and got a big exemption for some of that, uh, I've asked him a question. We're going to have a direct conversation on it. The president uh, talked to me Monday night about overall RFS issue and asked me if, we, if I would guide that to a conclusion based on where we are. Our goal is really to get to an RVP of 15% where the E15 can be sold year <coughs> round, which will grow that provision. We have some ideas about how to do that. The petroleum people haven't been interested unless they could get some other considerations over REN prices, which is understandable uh, in some ways, but uh, 
Uh, it's a good question, and I don't have the answer right now about how much volume of that $15 billion has been eroded with waivers. Uh, EPA, I think, has taken the position they don't have to announce that, but I'm pretty sure that Scott will tell me if we ask him, and I'm going to really uh, impress upon him the fact that uh, uh, I don't it's not going to be in his best interest if he goes around the 15 billion by issuing waivers uh, overall. So, uh, but a good question. Thank you. I wanted to say I'm Marty Cox with the Kentucky Dairy Development Council, and I got some inside scoop from some Georgia milk producers on you, uh, and, and they said you really did like chocolate milk. You just mentioned that. That's right. And so I've I've got some milk in ice cold milk. And <laughs> Would you pass it up, please? <laughs> thank you, sir. There you go, and thank, thank, you. thank you. Two things on that, though. Uh, I figured we get rid of a little bit of surplus. You take it with you. <laughs> the second thing. Can I, I drink it here? You can drink it here. Okay. You can drink it on the road. But I was told. <laughs> That it, that it couldn't be a gift over $25 and in present milk prices. It doesn't <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your, Good. your comments on uh, about the dairy, and I know you, you're connected sure. with that. And uh, I know we may have some difficulty in, in getting uh, the, the MPP implemented with some producers because of their experience, but we're going to do everything we can to try to promote that and, and uh, uh, find a safety net. Very good. Thank you. I had one of these two days ago, so I'm, I'm going to have another one. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, I've got a, a question about Farm Bill. Um, just to give you a visualization here, raise your hand if you've ever worked or grown tobacco in your life. Just look at, just look at this. Now, if you're working in tobacco in 2018, keep your hand raised. So you can just see the dramatic effect there. And over the past 15 years, we've been lucky the governor's office of ag policy to re-diversify a set of master settlement agreement monies to really diversify Kentucky. But one of the one of the byproducts of that diversification is sometimes Kentucky is in a unique position when it comes to crop insurance. So it's like a lot of our farmers in this part of the state have not been growing grain as long as others, and, and so sometimes there's misalignment when it comes to ARC and PLC. And I was just wanting to know, I was just curious what your thoughts are about the future of crop insurance. And then secondly, during a period of stagnant commodity prices, we're trying to grow our markets internationally. And the, the MAP funding, market, market access funding program, is so important for us. And I know there's a push to maybe double that in the next farm bill. I just was curious what your thoughts were about crop insurance and also MAP funding. I think crop insurance is in safe hands. The chairman of the Senate Ag Committee, Pat Roberts from Kansas, kind of views himself as the father of crop insurance. So I think it's safe. The, the challenge will be probably more so in the specialty crops, how we make them actuarially sound. We saw some challenges, certainly in the citrus and the pecan issue with hurricanes this year. The other thing from, a, from the former tobacco growers uh, is really on the farm bill is how do you develop base and then what, what, what is the base left? We know in the buyout, we obviously from Georgia had uh, tobacco growers as well as peanut growers. And both those programs went away. And, and the base was eliminated, but how do you, uh, what is the reasonable way to allow these growers who used to be tobacco growers in order to uh, uh, build and accumulate base uh, for uh, the last few years? So it's, that's been kind of stagnant. So I'm hoping the Farm Bill will address a modern history of crop production that will allow them to qualify under uh, annual produ uh, production history in that way. The MAP program typically is helpful. I'm a, I'm a skin in the game kind of guy. Don't think you ought to depend on the federal government to do all your marketing for you, but for people who will uh, assess themselves through checkoffs and others, we want to be there as a real partner nat nationwide, internationally, frankly, to, uh, to help develop markets, to help to increase markets. You know with the challenge that we have with China uh, currently and maybe some others that uh, we've got to open new markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't, we've barely touched India. It's a very difficult place to do business with. Ted McKinney, our Undersecretary for Trade, has been there twice, and we continue knocking on that door. Mm -hmm. And then that's the way you develop markets, and that's what 
we've told the president about the China situation is you develop markets and you know Adam and your family knows uh, you kind of make you kind of tell a customer you're not going to serve him for a while or you can't get to him and uh, you lose them it takes them a long time to get them back that's what happens in trade there as well so we need to be trying to open it markets every door and that's what every day and that's what that uh, map money is for we're getting a signal for one more question I believe huh? <clears throat> <laughs> two, two more questions. Uh, I am Warren Bigler with the Governor's Office of Ag Policy. We in Kentucky have been so fortunate with this tobacco settlement, take half of it and put it in agriculture. Uh, do a lot of four governors and all these legislators understand? We've now invested $560 million in agriculture and grown agriculture on a low market from $3.7 billion to $5.7 billion, $2 billion in 15 years. We, uh, Dr. Senator Hornback talked about the Hopkinsville elevator. Uh, Mark Haney, the head of Farm Bureau, said we just keep growing corn and beans and piling up big piles and breaking even think we're doing good. The two growth areas we see are export, and that, you never know what that's going to be, and value added. Hopkinsville elevator this year gave back to their farmers 4,000 farmers, 61 counties, $39,518,000. this money. We want this money to be so impactful for, for farmers to help farmers help themselves, but at the same time to try to grow agriculture that it can be more profitable, get a little bigger piece of pie. <coughs> what do you see out there in ways that we can take this little bit of money we've got and uh, and make it better for, for Kentucky Ag? Well, actually, sir, with the growth that you've talked about, you ought to be telling me. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> yeah. We, uh, that's what rural development's all about and uh, uh, the, uh, the aspect of coming into rural communities. You, you mentioned one of those things and it is value added. Uh, uh, I mean, again, y'all do a pretty good job in these barrels here in Kentucky over value added. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that uh, mash turns into something that people pay for. But uh, we got to do better than that in other products and, and developing those things. And Kentucky, I think, has been pretty good in some of the value added things. How do we further process? And really, the, what we see in the international market is people love USDA products. Mm -hmm. And it's only the restrictions that their government keep out from a protectionist system that we aren't able, able to sell more, whether it's EU or Southeast Asia. So we need to be uh, really aggressive about investing in value-added products, further processing. First of all, it creates manufacturing jobs. It's good for producers with a better value. And uh, these farmers have got these letters. If there were something we could do uh, you know, from a dairy perspective, a dairy co-op or something here to uh, to make cheese or cream or whatever, that kind of thing. That's that's part of what USDA is also, uh, you know, wants to help in. Uh, a realistic idea, good business model plan, well underwritten uh, to be able to help from a rural development standpoint. We'd love to team up with states like Kentucky that have money where we could do a, a triangulation of private equity state funding USDA to make uh, one plus one plus one equal more than three. Yeah. One more question back here. Yeah, my name is Charlie Masters. We, my wife and I have a little big cattle farm over in Clinton County. And uh, we're kind of filling in the hole that we used to have from tobacco by value added selling uh, beef directly to the consumer. And uh, the commissioner has done a great job in, in formulating farmers markets which gives us a marketing venue for, for our beef. And with the USDA, there's a program for where the seniors are, uh, certain seniors are given vouchers to buy food at farmer's market. And the, but the food, it's got to be fruits and vegetables and herbs and honey, but it excludes protein, excludes meat. And while you two are here, it seems like something that a signature could probably... Uh, <laughs> 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 Ditto. We have to get it written. <laughs> we'll defer to Rebecca. That's right. Sorry, sir. I didn't know that was going to come. <laughs> if you just knew what kind of mother may I environment I operated like in DC, you'd, you'd understand it. I can get that done in about 10 years. No. <clears throat> That's part of probably part of the farm bill, though. Really, that 
is another idea we can take back. Let's show the Secretary of Appreciation. <laughs> I think we have a couple gifts for you. Uh, I know you're a milk guy, but here in Kentucky we have L81. Do not drink this before bed. A lot of caffeine. Uh, great signature Kentucky product. And also, for you to share on the bus are some bourbon balls. And the best thing about bourbon balls is that if anyone gives you a hard time about it, you can eat the evidence. So enjoy. Good. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Mr. Secretary, it's been a pleasure to be with you today and your wife, Mary, and your team. And it's good to see our friend Rebecca back. Many years ago, she was with the Farm Bureau team. Thank you for mentioning that. And you're taking good care of her. I think she's taking good care of you. So Kentucky's got connections all around. Part of what you're doing in agriculture is being an ambassador. You understand it, but you're telling the story. And just to share an example, one of the things we're doing here in Kentucky, the Kentucky Farm Bureau commissioned a book this past year. And it's a wonderful dream. It's a story about a young boy here in Kentucky in his love for agriculture. And it kind of walks through his daily life and how he connects with agriculture. Since last fall, we've had over 5,000 of these books placed in different classrooms around Kentucky. In fact, the day as I was driving here, one of our women chairmen was on the phone talking to me about she was so disappointed. This is spring break. So she had the week off of being in the classroom reading this book to children. To me, that's a great example of volunteers helping tell the story of agriculture. Secretary, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the leadership. Yeah. Thank you for what you do. Kentucky Farm Bureau, we want to give you, you this book. Hope you and Mary and the grandchildren will enjoy Cheers. this. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got, uh, we've got one more gift for you, but uh, before, we, uh, before we give you that, we just want to uh, both uh, publicly thank uh, you for, for attending, your staff for being here in the USDA. We want to thank uh, Commissioner Corals, the Kentucky Department of Agriculture, for being a part of this, and for Kentucky Farm Bureau and Mr. Beck for co-hosting this event with us here today. also want to give a, a quick shout out to RFD TV for, for helping with this event, and uh, most importantly, we want to thank everyone in the room for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here to, to support Kentucky agriculture. So we've got a gift from the Hinton family. There's only one other of these that, that mm. exist outside of one of our buildings, and Commissioner Quarles has the others. So this is a, uh, this is a, uh, an old, it's a replica of an old feed bag, burlap bag, that we'd be honored if you would hang that somewhere, or if Miss Mary wants to hang that, that somewhere. Uh, but we'd like to send that with you, and, and thank you so much for all that you are doing for agriculture across our, our state, but also across the U.S. Thank you, Adam. He called this burlap. In Georgia, we call it something else. Y'all ever heard of a croaker sack? We had a uh, state senator, Mr. Chairman, that said uh, uh, we were down in South Georgia talking about broadband, David, uh, there, and he said, we got folks in Atlanta in the legislature don't know a croaker sack from a cul-de-sac. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's a name after a governor, and it was his name was pronounced Houston. I always loved the fact when our company was named Houston Fertilizer and Grain, and I'd call out to Texas, talking to some people business-wise, and they said, uh, how do you spell that? I said, well, it's pretty simple. It's spelled just like Houston, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we have one more gift that showed up on, on behalf of uh, Sam Johnson, one of our state FFA officers are here today, and he's got a gift on behalf of the All Kentucky right. FFA yeah, Foundation. Really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Again, we want to thank all of you guys for coming. Help us thank the secretary. You're welcome to stay as long as you'd like. We're open for business. Stay and visit. We appreciate each of you.